Hi everyone, welcome to my green closet and part three of the wool series. So a couple weeks ago, I got to visit a regenerative wool farm and mill called Longway Homestead. It was very interesting to see and learn about what they're doing and I'm going to share that experience with you. I really wanted to meet Anna and visit Longway Homestead because she is extremely passionate about education and advocacy and does a lot of work to share information about regenerative fiber farming. It was really amazing to see how Longway Homestead takes such a holistic approach, even with things like incorporating a natural dye garden into their system. So when we arrived on a lovely sunny day, Anna showed us around and we first got to meet their sheep. Many of the sheep were very social and immediately came over to check us out and get some pets. They have 40 Shetland ewes with some merino crosses as well and they have all ages from new baby lambs just a few weeks old to this sweet elderly lady who I think is 15 years old. They also have a llama and llama alpaca cross who serve as guard animals to keep the flock safe from predators. Anna also explained that they don't have males because their horns can get caught in the type of fencing they sometimes use. However, you can keep castrated males and females together. Each time I visited a fiber farm, I always love hearing about the different sheep's personalities and they really are such sweet animals. So Longway Homestead follows regenerative practices and here is how Anna describes it. Very briefly to explain it, um, you know, carbon is in our atmosphere, it's taken into plants through the process of photosynthesis and that carbon can be stored in the roots and the soil, which is excellent. Um, so using sheep as a tool of land management to encourage better and more growth through those plants will sequester more carbon from the atmosphere and hold it in the soil. So that's one way. The other way is that when sheep eat that grass, they convert it into energy, which helps them grow wool. Wool is almost 50% carbon. So when you wear something that is made with wool, you are wearing a carbon sink on your head or your body or whatever. Um, and that carbon will stay locked into that wool until you compost it or, or trash it. And then it will go hopefully back into the, into the soil as carbon uh, and other nutrients. Wool itself has the ability to sequester carbon from the atmosphere and hang on to it. And then sheep, when used in a healthy way on the land base, also have the ability to sequester more carbon into the soils. The advantage of being a small farm also is that we get to see the immediate inputs and outputs of everything that we do on the farm, right? So if we graze our sheep far too heavily on one patch of grass or pasture, we're going to see the impact of that immediately within one or two years. In the same way, we can see the advantage of proper management pretty quickly. We're constantly looking at what we're putting in and what we're taking out. So for example, the way we graze our sheep and the way we manage them uh, really limits a concentration of feces and urine in one spot. It spreads it out throughout the whole pasture. And where there is a concentration, we take that and we use that to amend our dye gardens. We plant dye plants that are very happy to grow in nitrogen rich soil, which is provided by the manure from sheep and they grow really well. We harvest that and then we um, use that to dye the wool that we took from the sheep. We're able to see within one or two seasons the impact of all our management and you know, to grow better wool, uh, to grow better dye plants and um, ultimately to grow better healthy soil. I also asked Anna about the criticism that sheep produce methane and therefore can't be part of a sustainable system and she had some great points. It's more nuanced than just straight up sheep farts and burps produce methane. Yes, they do. Um, I think if we look at it historically, we forget that at least in North America, we used to have millions of bison, which are ruminants and burping and farting methane into the atmosphere never mind the elk and the caribou. So the numbers of actual ruminants on our land base has shrunk compared to where it used to be. What hasn't shrunk, what's increased, is the other releases of methane through different forms of agriculture. So we have to look at the whole industry. What is happening with the vehicles that we're driving to produce different agricultural products? Um, let's look at factory farming. That for sure is a really negative way of producing more greenhouse gas emissions. The other thing that I think is important when we look at sheep as a, and livestock as a management for 
for sequestering carbon or dealing with greenhouse gas emissions is that carbon is a really long lasting gas. So carbon's gonna stay in the atmosphere for much longer than the methane. So when we look at the longest term effects, we really need to be focusing on that carbon. Our agricultural system is so broken and it is, it is you know, fundamentally flawed. We are producing more food and more textiles than we need in order to survive. So I think first and foremost, we need to look at consuming less and then looking at the ways that we can produce what we need rather than just everything we want. I mean, amen to that. Like I've said previously, these types of systems just will not work in a fast fashion climate. So anyways, after meeting the sheep, Anna showed us their pellet processing. So they create these wool pellets from parts of the fleece which can't be used for yarn. And these pellets are used by gardeners to add aeration to their soil. They also hold and slowly release water so you have to water less. They can help with certain pests. And as the pellets biodegrade, they add nitrogen and other nutrients. So again, it's a way to keep things circular, improve soil health, and return nutrients back to the soil. And I think it's very cool that they're taking something which would often be seen as waste and creating a product that you or I can use to improve our gardens. After that, we checked out their dye garden, which wasn't all planted yet, but Anna showed us some of the dyes they had previously harvested, even including indigo. I love natural dyeing and it was very cool to see how they incorporated dye plants into their regenerative system and how they are able to produce yarn where everything from the sheep to a finished dyed skein can all come from and be done on the farm. From there we went to check out the mill and I've been to a couple wool mills before which had huge equipment so I was very surprised to see how they fit everything into a garage. It's a big process to turn fleece into yarn that I think most people don't know much about. First, the wool has to be cleaned, hay and other bits removed, and the wool is washed. The washing can use a lot of water, and this is also a criticism I've heard a lot with wool, but Anna explained that they use a biodegradable soap and all of the wastewater is used in their garden. Then it's a multi-stage process to fluff, card the fibers, turn it into roving, spin it into yarn, and then spin it again to create two or three ply yarn that is both fluffy and strong. It is a surprising amount of steps and work to get just yarn, and of course that's not even a finished garment yet. I asked Anna about if they get any pushback about the cost of their yarn and what she would say to someone who thinks the price point is too high. <laughs> I would encourage them to come for a tour because when you see what goes into processing wool, you've realized the time and energy and resources that goes into it, and then it makes you wonder, why is all your other yarn so cheap? And not only that, that's just the processing. I, I always talk about the true cost of wool. A ewe gestates for five months. And during those last two months is when the fetus lamb is growing all their secondary follicles. And the secondary follicles are what produce the wool. And so whatever that lamb is born with is what they'll have for the rest of their life. So that mum needs to be in such good condition so that her lamb can grow enough secondary follicles to produce enough wool for a harvest 18 months later. So I am thinking about the amount of good quality wool that I am going to shear off of that sheep 18 months before it's ever sheared the first time. That kind of energy and work and focus is huge, but that goes into it and that has value. So after touring the mill, we sat down to chat more. I asked Anna about dedicated fiber farms versus wool that is a byproduct of the meat industry, which is the majority of wool that's actually produced in Canada, and most of it can't even be used. With the, the lamb and meat industry, the focus isn't on the wool, so it's the wool production is seen more as an offset to feed costs. You don't have to feed as much to, to supplement for that heat because they've, they're growing their wool, but that speaks to sort of the bigger issue. If wool was valued more, farmers would be paying more attention to the quality of it and we'd end up with a better product as well. What we see mostly with dedicated fiber farmers is they're small to medium sized farms. They're raising unique or heritage breed sheep specifically for wool and they're direct marketing it. So they're either selling that raw wool to hand spinners and fiber artists and crafters or they're turning it into a value added product like yarn or roving and then selling it to those unique markets. And we also represent farmers that are often left out of the conversation. So women, young people, 
um, queer people, BIPOC people, uh, who are running and farming in these spaces. So I think that is indicative of opportunity for growth because for the most part, fiber farmers are doing things a little differently. I then asked Anna about her perspective on the animal welfare issues that unfortunately can be part of the industry. I think the number one takeaway is that harvesting wool from sheep is necessary for their health and welfare. Of course, there are going to be instances where people are abuse their position in that, but to be honest, that's few and far between. I am not a shearer. I hire a shearer as someone that not only values the health and safety of my animals, but also the quality of my fiber. If my shearer showed up and started nicking my sheep or treating them roughly or um, hurting them, that, that would be the end of it. Um, I don't know shearers that act that way, unfortunately. Perhaps there are instances of that that people hang on to as uh, reflective of the entire industry, but that is not the entire industry. I don't see it in a vacuum either. I think we must ask ourselves where we're drawing our clothing from. Like what, I guess the best way to put it is what carbon pool are we pulling our clothing from, right? Is it this natural carbon pool where natural fibers are sequestering carbon and hanging onto it? Or is it these um, like fossil based carbon pools? The animal welfare issue is one part of that, but I'm, I don't know how we can claim to care about animal and human health while wearing microplastics and synthetics. So I want to jump in and echo that last point a bit because I used to buy and recommend a lot of vegan products and brands that I no longer do because it's just too much plastic. I think we need to recognize that creating more synthetic fabrics and virgin plastics is harmful not just to our environment but to animals. And that seems to be a blind spot many vegan brands have. So, I mean, if you want to avoid animal products, great, but a lot of the vegan options available are unfortunately just not good alternatives. So then I also asked Anna what people can do if they want to ensure that their wool is ethically sourced and if it's best to try and visit farms. Yeah, I think the most powerful way to understand the source of your textiles is to get to know the farmers that are producing it. That's going to be harder when we buy our clothes from, you know, bigger companies or places where there isn't that traceability. But, you know, we open our doors for our shearing so people can come and watch the entire process and observe it themselves. Um, people can come to our farm and I know other fiber farmers open up their doors all the time. And I think once you see how farmers are with their animals, how much they care, you realize that there is a, that, that animal welfare is at a height. And then finally, we chatted about how while there are some great yarn options for knitters, if you don't knit, there unfortunately really isn't a way to get clothing made from locally sourced wool. So the biggest complication in the Canadian context with producing clothing that's made out of wool is the infrastructure. So we don't have enough infrastructure to take raw wool and turn it into yarn but we have even less to take that yarn and turn it into a textile. That's a big barrier in our, like, in our wool industry is the only products that we're producing in Canada from Canadian wool is yarn for knitters, yeah. right? And that is a small, I mean, that's why I'm excited about the wool pellets. All of a sudden it expands this conversation about wool. There's such a huge segment of our population that are gardeners, so it's opening up that conversation. Um, when we put wool in our bedding, it, mm -hmm. it opens up that conversation. Why is wool pillows or wool mattresses or wool duvets better for us and how we sleep, but then also for the environment and the farmers and obviously the reduction of synthetics. Um, I think it would be so fantastic if we got to a point where we had more available products made from Canadian wool that were accessible to all Canadians. Although on that note, if you aren't a knitter or can't get wool from an independent fiber farm, then check out my previous video where I talk about the ZQ wool certification and traceability and transparency with wool. Anyways, I hope this video doesn't end up being too long. It was so interesting to visit Longway Homestead and a huge thanks to Anna for being so open, chatting and showing us around their farm and mill. I think it's really admirable what they've already accomplished and all the work they're doing to improve the industry in Canada. Also, if you are a knitter, they have a very cool natural dye CSA program or a monthly breed specific wool subscription you can check out. 
Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed coming with me on this trip to the wool farm and I'll see you in the next one.